Hello folks, uh, Brian here and uh, welcome to this uh, talk. This, this will be a session, um, this is part one of a three part talk on creating custom PCBs. Um, and this first one will be about uh, how to create actually, or how to capture a schematic, um, how to design a schematic for PCB. And then in the next session, we're gonna do layout. And then um, once we've got that, and that's the physical board layout, and then after that, we're going to talk about how to assemble these and have practical ways to assemble them at home. <clears throat> As with the other sessions here, DevCamp, uh, this is focused around Klima. In fact, we are going to uh, spin part of the Klima custom PCB. This is the uh, overall schematic design. And in this, this is just an introduction session and, and to get you started. And we're going to we're going to add this. Um, BME 680 or 688 uh, temperature, pressure, humidity sensor also does air quality. And then we're also going to do solar input. So we're going to do a sensor and power, which is it's a pretty, uh, pretty good example of a general um, IoT solution. You know, you know, you have pick up um, some sensor stuff, take some readings, also maybe power off a solar panel. And um, yeah, so it'll be a good session to get you introduced to creating your uh, own boards at home and uh, we'll get you started there. Now, the first thing I actually want to talk about is, is maybe why even create a PCB board in the first place? Why spin, why bother spinning a custom board? Um, you know, cause you can certainly prototype, you can breadboard at, at home and whatnot. Um, <clears throat> but these two images are a good example of actually why you might want to do this. Um, of course, as you go to production, you're going to have to spin a custom board no matter what, right? Like that's when you're when you're creating an end um, product, then uh, it's really necessary for it to, to in order for mass production. Uh, but it's also oftentimes it's easier uh, for prototyping uh, than maybe doing something like what we see here. So typically when, you're, when you are prototyping, the for, first step is to create a breadboard, um, a, a breadboard solution, something like this. And then as you continue it on, you might start soldering things together in a more sort of permanent way. <clears throat> and the challenge with this is that when you're actually doing this, you'll find that the routing and layout on this is pretty hard. Uh, wires going everywhere. There's a lot of things to solve. And I find that uh, these days with the PCB supply chain being what it is, it's so easy to just spin up a, a PCB and then um, order it to fabrication and you get it a week or week later. And I find that just to be uh, really a, a, a lot easier than trying to sit down and get the soldering gun out or sort of soldering iron and, and putting things together this way. It's also much more reliable. You know, in um, <clears throat> when you're working with uh, prototypes and breadboards, oftentimes you're solving problems in which you're debugging and you're like, oh, the ground wire's loose. And if you've got a custom PCB, that's not really a problem. So let's talk about Let's talk about the prototyping process overall because I think that's important uh, in 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 building. You know, when building a custom PCB, it's really about uh, moving through the product design life cycle, and, and part of that is is you know putting together a, a prototype that solves your challenges. And and I always tell folks, look, <clears throat> the first step about prototyping is you need to take a look at your overall problem and you need to break it into pieces and and solve each one of those pieces and then put them together. And, and as you're solving them, I highly recommend using modules, um, pre-built modules that you can get off of, like, get off of uh, SparkFun or Adafruit, etc. And oftentimes, even the most complex designs are really just a bunch of simpler pieces put together in sort of aggregate. And I mentioned these modules. These modules are a great way to start uh, prototyping because what they've done is that they've taken the essential piece that you're going to work with, say a motor controller or a sensor or something, and then they've added the requisite components that are needed in addition to that particular component for that component to work. And then they put a header on there and then that is uh, easy for breadboarding or you can put that in your own, uh, even in a, a uh, custom PCB by just putting a header on there. And a note about when sourcing or buying these components, uh, 
you know, most of the time what I like to do first is to purchase from SparkFun or Adafruit uh, and get these components because they are really optimized to be high quality. And, and these folks, uh, you know, both of those companies are really fantastic. They build quality components and there's a, there's a lot, they take a lot of pride in, in their work. And uh, I rarely have them fail on me. On, on the other hand, uh, you, there's a cheaper way to do that, which is to go to AliExpress or eBay or Banggood, and you can buy uh, these things much, much cheaper and typically in higher quantities. And the challenge with those is that they are optimized for price, not quality. So if you do purchase them, make sure that you purchase quite a few of them and, or you know, more than, more than one or two, and then uh, know that some of them are just not gonna work, and that's just part of the game. <clears throat> now, when you're designing a PCB, there's, I mentioned this before, but there's basically uh, uh, three or four parts to it. Um, there's three parts that we do, and then there's something that, that is typically done elsewhere. And the, and the first part is laying down the design. That's the schematic. Um, and uh, that's also known as schematic capture. And then when you do the actual PCB layout, that's called PCB layout or PCB design. And then you send that design off, you send off Gerbers, which are uh, drawings, which your, your design tool will create. You send those off to a fabricator and then they fabricate the PCB and then you, you get that and then you can assemble. And um, that means putting down solder paste and then your components and then heating them up until the solder melts and then everything welds to the board. And you can also outsource that as well. Uh, but for most, most boards that you're gonna be building that are uh, Meadow IoT, you know, most of those can be done at home pretty easily. And we'll talk about that in a later session. And when you're actually creating these PCBs, you'll use a tool that's uh, an EDA tool. And uh, there's a number of them that are either free or cheap or accessible in, in various ways. Um, the one that we're going to be using today is called Easy EDA. You can find that at easyeda.com. And I find that to be just a really nice, easy to use, uh, very powerful EDA and uh, EDA tool. And it, for the most part, does exactly everything that I need. And, and um, I have run into very few limitations with it. So it's a really great it's a good product. Other ones uh, to n notable mentions, uh, fritzing is one that allows you to sort of takes a different approach and it allows you to lay them out from a breadboard perspective, which is kind of interesting. Um, but the development on that has been kind of spotty over the years. It's, it's always kind of a question of whether or not it's actually supported right now. And then um, KiCad is the one that we use internally for our Meadow modules. Now that's a, that's a high end, uh, it's a high end, EDA tool, high end in the sense that it's got a lot of features. Um, it's, it's, I find it a little challenging. I don't love the UX, um, but it does do some things that other stuff, uh, you know, that maybe EDA doesn't quite do. Um, but for the most part, I think EDA, EDA is great. <clears throat> and um, a new one on the block is flux.ai, and that one is uh, still kind of in its early stages, but it looks pretty. It looks like it might be pretty good. So that's one that I would recommend trying. And then um, Eagle is one that I mentioned just because it's it is uh, reasonably priced. It used to be free, but it was acquired by um, Autodesk, and it's not totally free anymore. I will say I don't love Eagle. Um, neither does our uh, our engineer, our electrical engineer. You know, the UX is really frustrating and and it hasn't really gotten any better since it was acquired by Autodesk. And then of course there are a pile of other ones that are cost a lot of money um, and and probably the gold standard one is Altium. Um, Altium is probably the nicest EDA tool there is but it also costs something like $30,000 a year so it's pretty expensive. Uh, but like I said today we're going to use EDA, EDA and without further ado why don't we just jump into it. So here is Easy EDA, and I've already logged in. And the first thing I'm going to do is uh, create a new project. So I'm going to say this is going to be Dev Camp 21, and we're going to do Klima. <clears throat> Klima Simple. This is going to be a simple version of Klima. 
very cool. And then it automatically creates a new schematic file for you. So if you hit save, you'll see it shows up. And we're just gonna rename this, we can call it schematic. Schematic. Clean my simple. Okay, now a real quick tour of the interface here. This is our editor area, this is our project area. Um, and then on the left, this is this will change depending on what you've got selected on the left navigation here. So you could be project or it can be um, design information. These are uh, standard components. And then this is the component library for uh, more components. Uh, so that are sort of specific components, etc. will be up in the library. And we'll talk about those in a bit. <clears throat> And then there's some tools over here for laying out your design um, and some drawing tools. And, and the first thing that we wanna do is we're gonna add a meadow board. And in this case, we're not actually gonna add the meadow itself, but really just the meadow, uh, the meadow IO. And I'm gonna come down here and I'm gonna search for meadow. And this, this is a good time to talk about this library. So the, uh, when you're adding parts, if it's a simple part, oftentimes like a capacitor or resistor, I just grab them from here. Otherwise, you can go in here and you can search for the specific parts. And there's, uh, they're organized by symbols and footprints. Symbol is the schematic symbol, and then a footprint is what goes on the PCB itself. And, and the classes is, are, are somewhat interesting. So in this case, there are, this is the group uh, in which they belong to. So user contributed is a place where you'll, you'll find a lot of components. Um, and then LSC, SC are like official components available from LSC, LC, SC, which is a big um, Asian component supply house. And those are the symbols in there and the footprints are generally high quality. Um, and the ones that are user contributed are also generally high quality, but you often have to just double check the footprint. I found things that I've had to fix here and there. Uh, in this case, I'm gonna find Meadow and Workspace because these are things that, that, that I've created. So if you open this up, you'll find Meadow and User Contributed. But if you, as you create parts, as you create a library, you'll find them in, in Workspace. And we'll, we'll explore this a little bit more later. So you don't have to, don't have to remember everything now. Um, but I'm gonna choose a Meadow F7 V2 Micro PTH. That's a through hole, PCB through hole wing. And this is a symbol that I've created specifically for, um, specifically with the intention of it being used in wings because it already has the outline of the meadow board. <clears throat> so we're gonna grab that and then we're gonna do place. So I'm just gonna put that here. And then I'm gonna add a BME 6, 680. So I'm gonna go in and search for BME 680. And this is a good case in which you can see there's an official part, which is great. You see the symbol, the footprint, and then even a picture from LCSC, and then also their price for it, which is very nice. And then there's a bunch of them that are user contributed. And again, these are, you'll see as we kind of click through these, some of these, like, is that a good footprint? I don't know, it doesn't really have enough area for the solder, solder paste, right? If you look at this one, it has, kind of a wider footprint for the solder solder paste. Um, so that's the kind of thing that I'm talking, I, I mean when, you know, when you look at the user contributed stuff, you really have to kind of double check, check it. So, and some of them are for like, these are obviously for uh, this one here is for a breakout. So this is maybe like an Adafruit bar breakout or something, I'm not really sure, um, cause it doesn't, it doesn't say in here. <clears throat> but in this case, we're gonna start with the official part and we're gonna, place that and uh this is a good time now okay so we've got we've got our basic components down and now we need to figure out okay what's next so this is a good time to introduce data sheets and data sheets are your friends so let me switch over to the data sheet here for the bme 680 <clears throat> and the um, these data sheets are easy to find if you if you open up a browser and you um, you know if you just Google BME 680 data sheet you'll find them. Um, but this is also a good time to introduce you to one of my favorite component search sites, Octopart. And Octopart is a fantastic way to find components and get their prices. It's very similar. There's another one called OAM Secrets. Dot com. This is another one that's uh, similar to Octopart and also very good. 
Um, but I personally find, um, and I know some people prefer OEM secrets over Octopart, but I prefer the UX uh, in, on Octopart. So if I go in here and then type in search for BME 680, you see that's a breakout, that's a breakout, that's a, you know a breakout. It's when by breakout I mean a module that has the sensor and um, additional components. But I just want to look up the actual component. So here it is, and you can see here. <clears throat> This has um, who has them in stock, what their prices are at, at what scale, um, and then also a link to the data sheet. So this Octopart is an awesome way to find parts. And you can also uh, browse by category and whatnot, which is a, a nice way to discover parts. So switching over to the data sheet, when you're doing PCB design, when I, see, when I say that the data sheet is your friend. I really mean that. When you you're going to spend a lot of time in in the data sheet, and the data sheet will often have, almost always, will have like some sort of use diagram. In this in this case, in the BMA BME 688, it's called a connection diagram. But like looking up, here's another uh, here's a data sheet for the SI7021, which is another atmospheric sensor, and I use this. Um, I use this sensor elsewhere. I use this um, uh, in, a, in a beehive, but um, you can see the application circuit for this, this diagram is actually very nice. And the BME looks very similar. You've got, this is uh, it's connected towards to I squared C, which is a, um, a two wire bus. You've got clock and data lines. And then there's pull up resistors, which we'll talk about in a moment. And then there's a decoupling cap here, and then it's connected to ground. So this is like, a, this is a great example of a good data sheet in, a, in, a, in an application circuit diagram. The other thing about this data sheet is that it also has, um, for the, each component, it has sample part numbers and whatnot. <clears throat> Again, this is very nice. Uh, the BME data sheet is a little uh, more rustic, we'll say. Um, and BME is BME uh, 280, 680 is a little bit more complicated of a sensor. You can hook it up either I squared C or SPI. And um, in this case, we're going to use it uh, as an I squared C sensor. Now, SPI is great for high speed uh, buses for like displays and stuff. But for sensors, I squared C is great. And in here it says, for the I squared C connection, which is what we need, it's recommended 100 nanofarad for cap one and cap two, that's over here. Um, and that's connected to VDD, which is power in, and VDD IO, which is also the power in, that's the level of the IO. Um, and it says, use a uh, 0 0.1 microfarad, uh, 100 nanofarad. Uh, those are decoupling caps and capacitors are basically like fast acting batteries. They store voltage. So you hook them up to power and ground and then they charge up to whatever voltage that is. And then as the voltage drops, it releases voltage. And so what happens is if there's a lot of things happening in the circuit drawing power, these store uh, voltage so that it can smooth out the uh, power in and make sure that this has constant smooth power, which is super important for digital circuits because digital circuits are very, they're, they're sensitive. They have, a, they have an operating range and they want to stay within that. <clears throat> and it's so-called decoupling caps because it decouples this from the rest of the power um, draw on the, on the circuit. So we'll add those. So we need two caps. Um, and then moreover, the value of the pull-up resistors R1 and R2 should be based on the timing interface, interface timing and the bus load. A nominal or a normal value is 4.7K. Um, and those are the pull-up resistors for the I squared C bus. So let's talk about that real fast. So let me go to um, our our documentation and let me show you what an I squared C bus looks like. So an I squared C bus has a clock line and a data line and then multiple peripherals, and there. Uh, controlled via addresses. So you send messages on the bus and you pre prefix them with an address. And then <clears throat> there's these pull-up resistors. Now, pull-up resistors are, are, are interesting. Um, they provide a default, default value for a line. So in digital circuitry, we have two values. We have either high or low, on or off. And, and in, in, in our circuits in CMOS, 
level circuits, it's either gonna be five volts or 3.3 volts for high and zero volts for low. And we want to make sure that, that those the signals are gonna be either one of two of those values. You know, we don't want them to be uh, floating because they might be an indeterminate value. So if we don't put any pull-up resistors on here, what happens is that this these lines are, are known as, as floating. And, and what a pull-up resistor does is they allow a trickle of electricity from something, from in this case from power, which means <clears throat> that it's, a, it's giving just a little bit of, of, of electrons that are at 3.3 pushing value onto this bus, which means that their default value is high. Now this can be pulled down very easily because this is, these are very high value resistors, which means they only let a little a trickle of, of current. And so it's easy to, to pull it down if you need to. But this provides a default value. Um, and so you need that on an I squared C bus. And so that's what this, that's what this data sheet is telling us. And typically, they are 4.7K, and that's kind of a magic number for I squared C buses. As you add more devices, you might change that, <clears throat> but it's a good place to start. And then it says, uh, finally, a direct connection between CSB and VDDIO is required. And that is the chip select, um, and that is for S that's for SPI. So the way that SPI works is you have... Um, multiple lines, you have a, uh, a data in and a data out line. And then instead of having addresses, you have these chip select lines. And whenever you want to talk to a peripheral, you pull a chip select line down, you set it to ground. <clears throat> and whatever peripheral has its chip select line pulled down will then listen. And so instead of addressing, and that could be faster, but it takes more IO. I squared C on the other hand uses addressing. And if you pull this chip select line down, then um, it puts it in I squared C mode and it knows it's just a listen on I squared C. So that's, um, that's basically it. It's, this is again, this is not a high quality drawing in this data sheet. So it's hard to know what's connecting to, to, to what and what's um, actually jumping over. This is, this is a connection where this is actually going underneath the line. <clears throat> but we know that this is basically what we need. So we're gonna go back over to Easy EDA and the first thing that I'm gonna do is start with power and ground. So I'm, I'm gonna go here and I'm gonna hook up uh, three volt three. Um, and, and when I hit W for the wire tool and I'm hooked this right to ground. <clears throat> and I actually, there we go, now you got it. And the other thing that I wanna do here is I'm gonna rename this because whenever I have power, I wanna know exactly what kind of power it is because Oftentimes I might have multiple power buses and I'm gonna change my alt snap so that I can move this around. So right now the, the regular snap is on five and that's not as much control as I want, but if I hold down alt, I get this alt snap and then I can move it a little bit um, more uh, with more precision. So there's power and ground on that. And then I'm gonna hook up ground right here. And again, hit W for wire and then wire up that. <clears throat> All right. so. We've got power over there and we're gonna put power over here again. And then we're also gonna do ground. And now let's hook up power. Um, so VDD and VDD IO, these are separate because sometimes on some sensors you might, you might put, you can put um, power of them with like five volts, but then the IO level is only gonna be 3.3 volts. In this case, we're dealing with 3.3 everywhere. So we're gonna, we're gonna hook up power to both of those. And those, I think it hooked up directly. And now we're gonna hook up ground. So I'm gonna run this out and I'm gonna run it there and just gonna do a little cleanup. Now, we also remember that that needed those decoupling caps. So if I switch over here, it says VDD and VDDIO both need these uh, two 0.1 microfarad caps. So I'm gonna go here and I'm gonna grab a capacitor and here it gives me different sizes. I'm gonna do 0603, which is about the smallest capacitor, um, the smallest uh, size that I will ever use in a hand assembled board. And if we pop over to our developer portal and we go to hardware circuits, 
there's um, SMD packages and sizes. You can see here, 0603 is still pretty small, and that's in an imperial size code, and that means six mils or six one hundredths of a, an inch and three one hundred by three one hundredths of an inch. Very small. Anything below that is too small to really like work with. So I want an 0603 uh, 0 0.1 microfarad capacitor. So I'm going to go to Octopart. And I'm gonna search for that. I want a 0 0.1, 0 0.1 microfarad capacitor, 0603. And I'm gonna just use Yagio because uh, that's a brand that we've standard on, standardized on internally for capacitors. Um, and we have a, and we have a, we just have a bunch of these. So here is, um, here we go, uh, 0603, 10%. Uh, 10% tolerance, it's fine, um, capacitor. And it looks like there's a bunch in stock. So that's fantastic. There's other details here about like, you know, um, X7R versus X5R and, and whatnot that are not really important. You can look those up. Um, but for the most part, you know, it doesn't matter on, on the designs that you're gonna be doing. The one thing that might matter is that when doing capacitors, you want to have a capacitor. Rule of thumb is that the voltage, uh, the voltage uh, on it, the voltage it's rated for should be about twice or more of what you're using. In this case, we're using 3.3 volts, so we need 7 volts roughly. This is a 16 volt. This is a 50 volt. We probably don't need 50 volt. 16 volts fine. So this is the one that we're actually going to use. <clears throat> and as you can see, there's a gazillion of them in stock. So this is the one that I'm going to grab. So Yagio, and I'm going to go over here, and then I'm going to say manufacture Yagio, and then I'm going to paste in the part number. And this will be available now later on in the bill of materials, the bomb. You'll see all the parts that are in, involved in this, and there is our that gives us our part and the manufacturer. That's important to put in here because later on when you actually go to source the, um, the bill of materials, you'll wanna make sure that you, you know what all the parts are. So we're gonna need two of those. So there they are. Um, I copied and pasted and each, again, so one of these goes to VDD, one of them goes to VDD IO, and then they both go to ground remember it's like a battery so that's good we got that in and i want to just make this a little more clear here um, so i'm going to do this cool and then going back to our diagram um, we have sdo so this is it's hard to see i squared c address bit zero or one is it ground is it zero and VDD IO pulled it up is one. So remember in I squared C that the devices, the peripheral devices are addressed. And this allows you by able to, by making these modifiable, it means you can have two of these on the same bus without having to do anything special. You just pull one up and pull one down for different address bits. In this case, I'm gonna just pull this down because it's we're gonna give it the first um, address. Uh, and again, we'll do a little, just a little cleanup here, just to make some more room. Um, do, 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 do. Let's make this all the way over to there. And wire those up. Cool. And then just clean that up. Cool. So this side is now wired up. Now we got to do the right hand side and it's ground, chip select, uh, serial data in and serial clock. <clears throat> so I'm going to first, let's uh, toss a ground over here. And one thing to note is that anytime these things share, anytime a, um, a net, these are all, these wires are all nets and anytime they share a name, that means they are going to be physically connected. Um, but instead of making wires go from here and then around and then, you know, like this sort of thing and making your uh, drawing really a mess, we can just name them. Uh, similarly, we can put these ports on there. So this is a net port. So we're gonna put one on here for this and we're gonna say call this I squared C data. And then we're gonna do another one. And by the way, space rotates these around 
and this is going to be I squared C clock. Copy both of those, and we're gonna connect them up over here. They're um, in that order here, so connect them. Oops, I'm not sure, there we go. Ooh, what's going on? All right, connect these up and then pull them out just to show that there's a uh, connection. <clears throat> these are now on the same net and we didn't have to run uh, a wire or a line all the way around. Um, so that simplifies it. And then going back here, chip select uh, says, finally a direct connection between chip select and VDDIO is required. So that basically says, hey, put this into uh, I squared C mode, always listen. Uh, rather than SPI mode. So we're gonna wire that up. And then let's wire up this ground and we're gonna move these over just so it's kinda a little cleaner. Ground, there we go. So that is effectively most of it. The final thing that we're gonna do <clears throat> is the pull-up resistors for this, for this bus. So we're gonna go in here, we're gonna copy these, select them here, and then we're gonna grab our three volt three. And now I'm gonna grab resistors and these are going to be 4.7K, 0603 again. These are resistors and capacitors are collectively known as jelly bean components. Um, and they're, you know, they're not very specialized. <clears throat> There's a lot of great brands that make them. Um, so we're gonna go, now I want an 0603, uh, 4.7K Yajio resistor, there we go. So that's what I want. So I'm gonna go search for that. Um, here we go, 1% uh, tolerance, 0603, 4.7. And there's a gazillion of them. So this is a good one. This is a, it's one that we use all the time. So grab that and switch over and Yagio and then the part number. And over time you'll get, you'll basically come up with kind of a library of your own components that you use all the time. Um, and when you're building, you, you wind up buying these things on reels because you use them all the time. Like we always use 4.7K resistors and 10K resistors and 0 0.1 microfarad caps and stuff. So we've got like them hanging on the, on, on the wall on pegboard. Uh, so you'll, you'll, you'll kind of get a library of your own favorite components. So here we are, we're gonna, we're gonna uh, wire these up to three volt three. And again, these are our pull up resistors. Let's make that a little cleaner. Boop. And, uh, oops, let's try this again. Cool, and then finally, I just wanna add a couple of labels. <clears throat> so this is going to be I squared C pull-ups. And we'll go over here, and this is gonna be our BME 680. <clears throat> and then this is our meadow. Okay, now the last thing that we're gonna do is that there's all these unterminated lines, and if we went up <clears throat> and we tried to convert the schematic to PCB, it's gonna say, you wanna check the nets first? And we're gonna say yes. And over here in the design manager, it's gonna give us flags for all these and say, hey, you have these, but they're not connected to anything. And that's not good. So we go up here and grab this X. There's no hotkey for this, even though it's a really common tool. Um, and we're gonna go in and terminate each one of these uh, pins. Okay, so now the basic design's done. There is one other thing that I wanted to do. <clears throat> I want to add our, um, I want to add our solar jack. 
Um, and I'm gonna go look at the Klima dock, the design, to figure out what that part number is. And it's over here. And the, all this Klima is uh, totally open source, so you can actually find this uh, schematic in the Klima repo, as well as the Gerber files, the output files, so you can have, you can make, um, oops, I must not have copied it. So you can uh, have, you know, you can make Klima on your own. Try this again. Let's do this. Let's footprint. Oh, here. Let's grab it from the name. Okay. Now, <clears throat> let's go search for that part. And this is a, a standard two and a half mil two by two and a half millimeter uh, jack um, connection jack. And I'm going to look through. So these are again these are user contributed so I'm looking here with a with sort of a, um, a critical eye of what I want to use um, this one is probably the one I'm going to use this one uh, actually looks like it's super high quality and um, I've, I think I've that's the one I used before some of these are you know some of these are like weird like I, I'm not gonna use that <laughs> but here's this one um, and it's I here it is, and the connections are on the right side. And for whatever reason, I want these on the left. Um, so I'm going to use this tool here, and I'm going to flip it horizontally. And this is the ground on the outside. This is positive on the inside. So we're going to do uh, ground and hook this there, and then <clears throat> just hook those together. And then finally, we're going to do a net port on this, and this is going to be, uh, we're going to call this six volt solar because it's going to be six volts, uh, what the solar panel gives off. And then we're going to hook that up to the five volt rail, which is a way to power Meadow from a solar panel or, you know, like a USB or whatever, you know, USB power. You can plug it into USB, obviously. Uh, so there we go. So that is our schematic, uh, more or less design from say solar in and there's other things you know you should go and update your uh, drawing information and whatnot uh, but let's check it out so let's go up to uh, convert schematic to PCB and there it is um, the nets were all good and then it's time to lay that out so that's exactly what we're going to cover in the next talk um, so I'm going to stop here and uh, yeah, so uh, jump into or we'll jump into the next uh, talk in a moment and cover that. So thank you very much.